Hey, how's it going? It's me, Amanda, and this is part three of the How to Deal with Noisy Neighbors series. It's actually a second series like this that I've done, um, and this one's super special because it's responding to comments that you've left on the previous videos I've done about dealing with noisy neighbors. Um, I actually just spent 12 minutes recording this for you already, and it crapped out on me again. <laughs> So I'm a little frustrated, but I'm also just like, fucking bring it on. This is the shit that I am practicing, and it's a great chance for me to practice what I preach. So just starting over, count that first one as a trial run, and hopefully this one will be uh, even better for that um, little glitch. So anyways, <laughs> today I am responding to a comment from Argentina, and the person said, yeah, how do I get over the control freak that lives in me? And I thought this was a great, great uh, comment because, yeah, that's what we're up against, right? There's this, in my experience, when I've been super irate and angry about my noisy neighbors, I have felt just completely at the whim of this uptight fucking ape shit control freak. And it isn't pleasant. It isn't fun to live with this person. And it's not fun to respond from that place. Um, it feels very stressful and aggravating. And so, yeah, let's look at it. What is it about us that wants to argue with reality, that wants to fight what is? Um, what is it? Why do I think I know what's best for me, for my neighbors, for the world? I mean, it's pretty arrogant if we think about it. It's pretty like, yeah, I should be in charge of the whole world and everyone in it because I know what's best. Um, we might think we do, but we don't. <laughs> That's been a good lesson for me to come to terms with. I don't know much about getting completely rid of this control freak, but I think understanding more about what's actually going on and why we do it can be helpful. And then we can um, turn that control freak into from being that like raging, aggressive, always loud monster to a tiny little yapping doggy maybe that we can just sort of pet on its little head or just this yapping pipsqueak thing that we can laugh at or um, choose to ignore or whatever. So and I want to share, too, that I had some really promising experiences yesterday where um, I'm living proof that this stuff works. Just a reminder, I am doing this work with you. The only reason I'm here sharing this kind of stuff is because dealing with noisy neighbors has been like the bane of my existence for years. And I've really, really been kind of a nut job around it and had to do a lot of work to calm down and to feel at peace. Um, and it's working, and that's why I'm sharing this stuff, because if it works for me, it can work for you. Yesterday, they started playing really loud rap music uh, right in the middle of a nap. I've been recovering from being sick. And I was just kind of surprisingly calm and uh, peaceful with it still. It just was what it was, even though it was loud, and I didn't get all freaked out like I normally would, and that was really neat. Um, and then they woke me up in the middle of the night as well with some music. And that was a little more challenging to deal with. But again, I did not react the way I normally would. And I was able to fall back asleep after just a couple minutes. And that's huge for me. So uh, again, if I can do it, you can too. So I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're learning this stuff because it really does work. Okay, so we're talking about the control freak. And I had come up with six kind of facets of this or reasons we might be experiencing this control freak part of ourselves. Um, the first thing is this idea of ego. Um, this is human nature. It's natural. And we could talk for a long, long time about ego and what that means. And there's lots of great teachers who've already written many books about this subject. But for our purposes here, I just want to talk about um, ego as the term that we can use to refer to our false self or this false identity that gets constructed. Um, it's human nature in the sense that we all get one and we actually need one to exist in the world, but sometimes it gets overly, we get overly identified with it. And so then we have to attack and defend. So our ego comes from uh, what we're fed from the time we start to exist on this world. It comes from our family, our culture, the media, our religious institutions, um, and it just starts to tell us like who we are, what our role is, what, what needs to happen, what people should and shouldn't do, what's right and wrong, etc. And our ego likes to have people to blame. It feeds on drama and strife. And if we have a lot, if we're overly identified in this certain identity, maybe it's in my case, it has been victim or good neighbor versus bad neighbor. Um, then we're on the lookout for anything that threatens our identity or our existence in the world. And then we feel validated and compelled to defend ourselves and attack these perceived threats. So this is just kind of a quick rundown of what's going on with the ego here. Um, 
And remember, too, we also have a brain that's constantly, we still have a very primitive primal part of our brain that's still scanning for danger, like physical danger. And a lot of the shit that we are reacting to in the world, we know logically it's not actually going to kill us. Like my neighbor being loud isn't going to physically harm me. But there's a part of my brain that does feel like I'm in danger and I'm unsafe. And then you add to that the ego that's trying to defend this identity that I have of like girl who deserves to sleep at a certain time or whatever. Like um, that can start to stir up this control freak and we feel like we have to change it. Um, another thing I thought was worth looking at was this idea of a hidden payoff. This can be kind of humbling or a hard pill to swallow. But frankly, we are not responding... Um, we're not this aggravated or upset unless we're getting something out of this pain and misery that we're causing for ourselves. So um, if you had asked me, what are you getting out of being in this war with your neighbors? Like, what are you getting out of this misery and suffering? I would have told you nothing. Like, I hate it. I would give anything for it to go away. But a deeper look actually revealed that I did have some subconscious um, Things that I thought I was getting from staying stuck in this way of thinking or staying stuck in this notion of being right or, or whatever. Um, I was maybe getting sympathy from friends or coworkers or my boyfriend at the time. Maybe I was getting a false sense of control. Maybe, you know, it's very easy to think that with all this raging and screaming and whatever, it feels like we're controlling, but we're really just spinning our wheels and not getting anywhere. So I could have been getting a false sense of smug superiority. Some people thrive on that, like this idea of like, I'm this victim and I'm right and blah, blah, blah. Everyone listen to how right I am. Um, it's humbling that, as that can be to admit that often is what's happening. And that's connected to the ego as well. So, um, and then when we're stuck in all of this false payoffs too, another false payoff can be that we are avoiding responsibility for doing our work and looking at our own shit. So if I'm always on the alert for what my shitty neighbors are doing, um, then I don't have to do the work that I came to this world to do. Like my art gets neglected or my, my own stuff that I need to work on in myself is, is getting neglected because I have this scapegoat that I'm angry and pointing a finger at and blaming. So just something to think about, like, what are you getting from staying angry? Are you getting something out of this? And, uh, can you look at letting that go? Number three, why we are being control freaks. We have unchallenged beliefs and expectations, and we have unwritten rules and notions about what people should and shouldn't do, what is right and wrong, what's fair and unfair. And it has been so liberating for me to learn that everything I thought was just a given or a fact or just true or right is actually completely up for scrutiny. And again, this connects back to our ego and our conditioning that we get from an early age of being humans on the planet. We are fed everybody else's notion of what's right and wrong and good and bad. And when we start to pick that apart, uh, we can find our own freedom. Um, because frankly, a lot of the shit that I believe about stuff is just other people don't follow those rules. Like they're my rules that I have for the world. And when people don't live up to them or follow them, I get all mad. And so I had to really look at, well, what are my rules for people in the world? And can I let those go? Um, this idea that neighbors should be quiet is so funny to me now that I've looked at it because on the surface it was like, yeah, of course they should. Everyone should be quiet and respectful and da da da. And I've lived in apartments for over 20 years now and that's just not how they are. And so it's so funny that I had this rule because it never, I never got it from reality. Every apartment I've lived at has had noisy neighbors. And actually I'm kind of the exception. I think <laughs> the person who's just like quiet in a home, um, but it's so funny that I'm putting it on everyone else that they should be a different way. Reality has shown me that it's just not that way. So uh, looking at that and being willing to let that stuff go can be really helpful. Uh, also, our feelings aren't facts. So a lot of times, um, I've talked about this before too, where we think that we are just at the whim of the circumstance. So the neighbor starts playing their music and I am helpless to feel anything but what I'm feeling, which is angry and upset. Um, and it just doesn't have to be that way. So following my work and, you know, working with other coaches and stuff like that can help you sort of separate that out and realize like circumstances are neutral. Nobody's in charge of your feelings except you. And um, you don't have to feel a certain way just because something is happening that you don't like. Um, even that's up for negotiation too. And again, that can be more videos down the road, but this idea of aversion and pleasure and like things that we say that we like and don't like, um, I've noticed that I can start to shift all that around too. And I will talk more about that as we go, because I think that's 
interesting stuff to think about. All right, here's a fourth thing out of six that I think um, kind of triggers our control freak. So for me, uh, forgetting about God is a huge reason why I'll get into control freak mode. Um, and let me say something about the God thing. So I definitely come from a spiritual basis here. I believe in something bigger than me that loves me and runs the show and is helping me and all that. I use the word God because I've made peace with that word. Um, I understand it's triggering or fraught for a lot of people, and that's fine. I'm not talking about any sort of specific religion or God or anything you have to believe in. Um, I just run my life on the premise that there's something bigger and takes an interest, and I really recommend... <laughs> Finding something that you can lean on that's bigger than you, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, I've tried it both ways and life for me is way better with some sort of God in it. So, anywho, this this one is about when I forget about God, um, my life gets really small and then I feel like I have to run the show. So, there's a lack of trust happening. Um, I'm not trusting in the inherent goodness of the universe, which I have come to believe in. I'm forgetting about the fundamental goodness and trustworthiness of my fellows, which I have struggled with. Um, I might be feeling that God is ignoring me or abandoning me in some way because I think something should be this way. And when it's not, it's really easy to just feel like God is not there. Um, or my God is just too small and unhelpful. And I really have learned that my higher power is able and willing to handle all things. Like God fucking got me sober. Um, he's not or she's not, or whatever, is not dropping the ball when it comes to my neighbors. Like, God does care about me in all situations, and just because it doesn't look like the way I want it to look now, it doesn't mean that I'm alone in this, or that I've been forgotten, or whatever. So a helpful thing that I've gotten, um, you know, in recovery, people always ask me if I'm, if I'm talking to someone about a problem, one of the first things that people will say is, where's God in this? And it's a good moment for me to go, oh yeah, I totally forgot I have a God. So, um, it's a good practice for me to remember to turn that over, turn everything over and just practice trusting again. Like this too will pass. This is serving a higher good. Maybe, um, this has a reason that I can't see right now, but it, I'll get through it. You know, I've learned to pray less for God to change my circumstances the, to the way I think I want them. And just like, give me the strength or the grace or the serenity to handle this perceived calamity. So yeah, there's that. Where's God? If you're a God person and you're struggling, bring your God back into the situation and give it over to your God. All right. Another big one. What triggers our control freak? Fear. I'm in fear. And me trying to control others um, is a way of managing that. So I have noticed that if I stop trying to control others, I have to come face to face with the fears that... Um, Things around me are fundamentally chaotic and unpredictable and rarely look the way I think they should look. My attempts at trying to get the neighbors to do what I want could just be me creating an illusion of control in an uncertain world. There is actually nothing that we can count on or rely upon except ourselves with practice and our higher power. Because before when I was in active addiction and alcoholism, I couldn't even trust myself. Um, and I'll tell you, when when I was really struggling with noisy neighbors, I felt like I couldn't trust myself there either because I would get so fucking angry and reactive. Um, so yeah, but with practice, we can trust ourselves and we definitely can trust our higher power. Um, in time, I found that this is more than enough, but at first coming to terms with this was kind of frightening. Like I cannot trust my neighbors to behave in ways I want. I can't even trust them to be that predictable. Um, but it didn't take me long to get on board with this because all the years of me trying to control other people were pointless and futile. So I finally let go because it didn't fucking work. And that's how I roll these days. It's like, I'm a lot quicker to see if something's not working, I'm not going to keep doing it. I don't have time for that shit. Uh, control freak comes out for sure when there's fear. I could just busy myself with the draining task of hating another person and trying to change them. And the ego boost I got from being right about the situation instead of doing the work to recognize the fear that was happening. Um, and this can be hard too, because sometimes our fears aren't rational or we don't want to admit that we have a certain fear. We're trying, again, back to the ego identity thing. Maybe we're someone who wants to be a tough person or a brave person or whatever. Um, so it can be hard to really look at like maybe a childlike fear that's emerging from this noisy, unhappy situation. Um, like I've shared about often I had like a small child situation inside of me that was just feeling triggered and unsafe. 
Uh, another fear I've pinpointed is um, that I'm a grown ass woman and I'm afraid I won't ever be able to just have like a good quiet home that doesn't have shared walls and low rents and, and a certain kind of people that afford those kind of rents. <laughs> I mean, you know, at a certain level of of rent, there's just a certain kind of people. It's like roommates often, it's younger, it's partiers, whatever. Um, I was that person too, you know? And so I get, I have to face my fear of like, oh my God, what if this is it for me? What if this is all I'm capable of? What if I can't have the kind of living environment that I really want? Um, and then with that fear comes a lot of judgment too. Like, oh my God, I can't believe you're such a failure. I can't believe you live this life where this is where you're living now, blah, blah, blah. So I've had to do a lot of work around that stuff and get over that. Um, and it's a practice. It's not just immediately I'm over it. It's just being gentle with myself. It's being kind. It's naming this kind of stuff and then moving through it. Um, let's see what else have I got for you We're talking about fear. And of course, bring God into that shit. Like some of these fears are just are big. And we talk a lot about just like handing that over to God, too, and just trusting that um, I can be transformed to be a kind of person who can move through everything, including all my big, scary fears. Okay, last but not least, um, a reason why we might have the control freak popping up is a lack of self-care. I am a huge, huge uh, cheerleader for self-care. I love talking about it. Um, I think it's so much bigger than just this idea of bubble baths and manicures. Um, so I'm really, I think more, let's see, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, one thing I noticed was that the more involved I was in making my own life awesome, the less I cared what the neighbors were doing. This was kind of revolutionary, but like on the days where I was making tons of art, um, I was in such a better mood. And then the neighbors would start up and I'd just be like, whatever, like it's a party. Like I have had moments where I felt like whatever, no big deal. It didn't even phase me. And those were days when I had been just really jazzed and involved in my own life. I was running around. I was booking murals. I was talking to people. I was just doing my own thing. And that's that's a huge, awesome gift to remember like hey if you're getting really upset about what your neighbors are doing maybe you're abandoning yourself in some way maybe you're neglecting your own life in some way um byron katie talks about how there's three kinds of business there's my business your business and god's business and um when we are in someone else's business we are not in our own and it's lonely so if i'm all up in the neighbor's business and what they should and shouldn't be doing um who's in my life no one so uh Getting back to my own life has been really helpful. Um, yeah, the times when I was most upset and frazzled were times when I just didn't have a lot going on. Um, getting in a tizzy about neighbors was a way for me to avoid my own fears or blocks or inertia or unhappiness. And so this is self-care to me is caring about myself enough to like really look at what's really going on here. Like it's not the neighbors that are making you so unhappy. Like what's really hurting um, it was easier to get mad about noisy neighbors when I was not tending to my grief around a relationship ending, for instance, or when I felt stuck artistically and wasn't making art. Instead of facing that and dealing with it, it was easier to just blame someone else and get mad about it. So I was thinking too today about, um, like, say you had a little baby that you were taking care of. I'm not a mom, but I can imagine like babysitting a friend's kid. Uh, I <laughs> Just say you're taking care of this little kid. It's a little tiny baby. It's so precious. You love it so much. And it's late at night and the neighbors start in with their fucking noise and the baby gets really scared and starts screaming and crying. Okay. What would be the best thing to do in that situation? Um, would you just start freaking out at the neighbors and let the baby cry in its crib while you just got all upset about what the neighbors did? Or would you go into the room and like hold the baby and rock it and soothe it and let it help it go back to sleep and be there for that child? And I was thinking about like my old ways of handling noisy neighbors was very much just like this part of me got triggered and upset and uncomfortable, but I'm just like raging at the neighbors and not tending and neglecting this part of myself that needed care. Uh, I was abandoning myself. And so I love this image of just like soothe the baby first. And um, that's been a huge part of my journey in self-care is like, oh my God, what can I do for you? Like, how can I help you in this moment? And then from there, once I've calmed myself and tended to myself, um, whatever that looks like, then, then I can decide what kind of actions I want to take, if any, about the noisy neighbors. Alrighty. So uh, I wanted to wrap this up with three takeaways, three practices that you can do to work with this stuff, because this was a lot of information. 
Um, so yeah, I would encourage you to uh, free write on this stuff, like journal about it. Excuse me. Meditate. I, if you're a meditator, um, I love to practice sitting with a question. So um, if you want to explore your ego or if you want to explore your fear or if you want to explore ways to take care of yourself, um, ask that question like to the universe or to your higher self or whatever, and then sit quietly with it and wait for an answer. And there's some cool shit that comes out of there. Um, you can take it for a walk. I do that too. I'll, I'll walk intentionally with a question or something I'm thinking about um, and see what comes to me when I'm moving that way. But just be curious and willing to explore. And so here are three activities you might write about or do that contemplate. Okay. One on the ego, uh, think about the role you might be defending. So the next time your noisy neighbors start up um, or whatever the situation is, this applies to so much more than noisy neighbors, obviously, but um, think about what role are you playing right now? What are you defending? Um, so like the commenter I spoke about last week who thought acceptance was for slaves, I can imagine that his ego might have an identity of being in charge, of being dominant, of not being controlled or abused by anyone. So if, if we can work with that, if we can understand what that is and that it's just an ego trip, that it's just a false identity, that the real you is so much bigger and more powerful and stronger than that, um, then you can start to let it go and it and it can you can feel free no matter what. Uh, looking at old ego constructs and false selves, by the way, it can be very painful. And I'm going to do videos about this too, because um, it can actually feel like de like something's dying in you. Um, but for now, just see if you're defending a role. Just be open to it. Um, some roles that I've had were like the hand wringing victim, like the poor me, or the good neighbor versus bad neighbor, um, or the angry punk rocker who don't take no shit. Like <laughs> these are all like just identities that I had and felt the need to defend. So. Uh, being willing to look at those um, is a good first step in trying to let them go or at least soften around them a bit. And it can get really humorous. Like this is, this can be really fun. Um, if we can let some light and this, this whole practice is about just like not taking ourselves so seriously and uh, experiencing joy in our lives. And we don't have to suffer over these things that we choose to suffer over. So this is a good way to start to get some light and space around these things that we take so seriously. The other thing, too, is that if we're playing the role of some kind of ego identity, that that's like an actor with a character and lines. And so if we're really overly identified, um, all our reactions are just because we're like in this mode of being this identity. So if we can choose to let it go, then that frees us up to respond differently, which I think is crucial. All right. Takeaway number two, working with fear. So. Take a piece of paper and without judging yourself, put all your fears on paper. This is a really good one to do like while it's happening, like while the neighbor is being loud and you're upset, get your notebook out and write down all the fears. Do not let your adult intellectual brain be dismissive or harsh with you about your fears. Let them all out, even if they seem ridiculous or childish, because they may be that on one level, but on another level, they're very real and they're very primal and they're actually hijacking you and running the show. So get all the fears down on the paper and really look at them. A short list of mine included fears that I would never get enough sleep and that I'd feel like shit or perform poorly at work. And then you can follow that like, and then I'm going to do shitty at my job and then I'm going to lose my job and then I'm going to be stuck here listening to all this even more and then I'm going to be homeless and I'm going to die alone in the gutter, right? That's what our fears kind of try to take us down to that worst case scenario. I had a fear that I would literally go insane. Like I would just lose my shit uh, and I would like do something felonious or deeply regrettable or just go nutty and never be the same. Um, I had a fear of my feelings. I didn't like feeling antagonized. I didn't like feeling like I was trapped. I didn't like feeling angry. And I was kind of afraid of those feelings themselves. Um, and then just, you know, fears that I was trapped and that it would never stop. So look at those fears. And then once you have that list, sometimes just getting them out is, is help enough. Uh, but then there's stuff that you can do to address those fears. Like you can step back into the adult you, the, the loving, compassionate, parent version of yourself and and address those childish those fears from that primal childlike place and take care of yourself like okay so if you're afraid of sleep then we'll figure out ways to take naps or um you know 
reassuring yourself that actually, you know, if your body needs sleep, you will sleep eventually. It's going to be okay. I used to think about the parents who had newborns that hadn't slept in a year, basically, <laughs> and they were fine. Like it was uncomfortable and um, they struggled, but you can survive. So just kind of tending to those basic fears and pushing back with reality and just talk to yourself like you would to a child that you love or to a dear friend and just find ways to ease fears or see if you can take actions. Um, I had a situation where neighbors would like smoke cigarettes on the patio of their place, which was right outside my bedroom window. And instead of fighting it, I just told myself like, okay, I'll just go sleep on the couch tonight. And, and it worked. And I think I only had to do that like once or twice with those neighbors. So just giving yourself that grace of like taking an action to address a specific fear is really helpful. And, um, yeah, I have more to say on that, but that's another video. Okay. Last takeaway addresses the self care issue. Um, this one's really cool. I've tried this before and it works, uh, soothe your other senses. So if you're, I don't want to downplay the stress that happens when you're really being exposed to harsh, loud, jarring sounds, like it sucks, especially when you're sensitive and prefer quiet. Um, it can just feel very aggravating and I get that. So if you really can't control what you're hearing at the moment, and if that is just not the way you want it, focus on all your other senses. You have several others, um, touch, sight, taste, and smell. And so, you know, get something really soft and cozy to wrap around you or fuzzy socks or that go-to cozy blanket to wrap up in. Or if you have a pet, like really just love on your pet and be mindful of how fuzzy that feels and find softness, find water, um, Take a shower or a bath or even just running your hands under warm water in the sink. Water is so soothing. Um, make some tea and let that be a whole experience. Of course, there's the taste of the tea, but then you've got the steam and you can let that be on your face. The smell of the tea, um, the calming aspects of it, the heat of the mug in your hands. Um, again, with taste, eat something delicious and really savor it. Get yourself your favorite ice cream or a really decadent chocolate or your, your favorite kind of pizza. Like really indulge in these um, other senses that you have. Look at something visually appealing. Um, I love cute baby animals, ocean scenes and pictures, uh, and my loved ones smiling faces. So go to that, feast your eyes on something amazing. Uh, watch something funny, get yourself laughing if you can. I love stand-up comedy for this. Um, and then if you can, counterbalance the sounds that you don't like uh, with more pleasant ones if you can. So again, comedy, hearing other people laugh is really helpful. Um, ocean sounds, white noise, music, you know, if you can like throw in some headphones and just listen to something different, uh, try to, try to do that. Okay. This has been a long one, but I hope it was helpful. Um, yeah, I feel good about this. Um, there's a lot of information here, but this is the shit that I think about a lot. And this is stuff that has truly, truly helped me and stuff that I actively practice with really good results. So hang in there, take deep breaths, be so good to yourself through this time. We will get through this. This will pass. I have got your back. I'm going to be back here on Friday with a new video, part four in this five part series. And then Stay with me to the end because I have a super exciting announcement that I cannot wait to share with you at the end of this uh, latest series. And I want to, yeah, actually I have two big announcements. So <laughs> I have surprises for you. I have treats. Um, but anyways, thanks for being here. I really appreciate all the feedback that I'm getting and the support and the love that I've gotten. Um, I really just want to help because no one should have to be as <laughs> fucking crazy as I was about this stuff. So if I can help, I'm happy to do it. So take good care of yourself and I will see you next time. Bye.